Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance and interest to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Labor Vision. Workers' compensation and the education of members of the community has been a priority of the Institute now for more than 25 years. And to continue with that initiative, tonight we've gathered together a panel of experts to continue our discussion on workers' compensation and the implications for workers in Rhode Island. I'd like to welcome our guests this evening, Michael Lynch from Beacon, Judge Robert Ferrari from the Workers' Compensation Court. Good evening. And Michael, oh, sorry, Stephen Minicucci from Calvino Law Associates. Thank you. Gentlemen, we have a number of programs throughout the year, both on labor vision and through educating high school students and adults in the community on workers' compensation, issues about who's eligible for it. Um, we often receive calls at the Institute saying, I've been injured on the job, what do I do next? And the first question we ask is, have you filled out an incident report? Um, the common answers we get are that they have not filled out an incident report, they don't know if they're eligible. We will let, even get questions about, um, I'm non-documented, am I, am I eligible for workers' compensation? And so I think those questions are important questions to address tonight, and rather than have uh, a formal discussion that we ask everybody on an individual basis, I thought tonight we would just sit down and talk about workers' compensation, issues of universal coverage, and a whole variety of pieces. So Judge, let me begin with you, and let's talk about this issue of universal coverage. Sure. Uh, as of January 1st, 1999, uh, any employer with one or more employees needs coverage through the Workers' Compensation System and Act. Prior to then, it used to be more than four employees they needed to have coverage, but there were, over the time, abuses with that particular part of the statute in that there would be, as we discussed prior to going on the air, uh, some employees would have three named employees for one month and then another three named employees for another month and they would try to get around the system, which created an unfair uh, business advantage for employers that were abiding by the law. Uh, in that the insurance premiums were less. Obviously, if you didn't have uh, to uh, get coverage, you could certainly make a uh, lower bid, if you will, in the construction industry and other industries, and it created a problem. And also, throughout uh, the United States, uh, more and more states, if not all of them, had adopted universal coverage. So Rhode Island, on January 1, 1999, uh, did adopt universal coverage. So now, every employer that has one or more employees needs coverage. Now. A lot of people say, well, I'm part-time, so therefore employers will say that's part-time as they don't need to be covered. That's absolutely wrong. Even part-time employees are considered an employee under the Act. In addition, family members, uh, if they're employees of the corporation or of the business, they are certainly considered employees under the Act and you need coverage. Uh, the hairy issues become independent contractors. Uh, well, he's not an employee or she's not an employee. They're an independent contractor, and we will discuss more of that as we, as we talk about universal coverage. Uh, but in those situations, if they are, in fact, an independent contractor, then no, there does not need to be coverage for that particular employee. And it's important because we discussed about you know, getting hurt and filing an incident report. You also want to know whether or not the employer is, has workers' compensation coverage. There should be some type of certificate shown in the business, although many times that's not done. But obviously, when someone gets hurt, the first thing they need to do is file an incident report, but they also need to determine if there's coverage and if there is coverage, who the carrier is. And I think I, I can kind of turn it over more to Mike on that issue in terms of insurance carriers and coverage, et cetera. Well, uh, Judge and Bob and Steve, Ironically, in, t in the timing of this program, last year our Department of Labor and Training has done an excellent job in establishing an online uh, publication, if you will, of identifying who the insurance carrier is for your particular employer. As Judge Ferreri indicated, if you have one or more employees, you're obligated to have workers' compensation insurance in the state of Rhode Island. And 
Judge Ferreri is absolutely correct. There's a statutory requirement that the identification of the fact that there is workers' comp insurance and the identity of that carrier needs to be posted in a prominent place within the workplace. If that's not available to the injured worker, then he or she can go to the Department of Labor and Training website under the tab for coverage, and it's very uh, easy to navigate through the website to determine who your employer's workers' comp carrier is. The obligation on the part of the employee is always to notify the employer. Uh, there are variations of either the employee not notifying the employer, thinking that it's an incident that's going to go away, or they'll feel better tomorrow, or they're afraid to report it. It's not only in the employee's best interest to report that injury, it's in the employer's best interest to report that injury to their workers' comp carrier as well because God forbid that injury becomes serious mm -hmm. or an issue arises as to whether or not an injury did in fact occur or whether there was an incapacity and an entitlement to benefits. It puts everybody in the best position right from the get-go whether or not there was an injury. So the identity of the insurance carriers available from the employer or at the Department of Labor and Training, and as Judge Ferreri indicated, notification is so important. And finally, to return to the topic of your initial question, universal coverage, every employer in the state of Rhode Island is obligated to have workers' compensation insurance. And the same is true in all of the other New England states and every state and territory of the United States of America. And uh, I know Steve has a lot of experience with the undocumented workers, so he can address that issue raised both by you and by Judge Ferreri. Yeah, I think that that's important because I think if Judge Ferrari and, and, and all, all four of us carried on a discussion of that prior to the tonight's show, and it, 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 it's a topic that all of us have some fingerprints in because we're all asked the question. Information is being seeked either through the offices, in the courts, or through Beacon. So, Stephen, what, in, in terms of non-documented workers, where, do we, where does that fit in, in the state? In the state of Rhode Island, we don't treat undocumented workers who get injured at work any differently than U.S. citizens or documented workers who get injured at work on the job. We feel like an honest day's work, regardless of whether you're documented or undocumented, is entitled to some degree of respect. And if you get injured trying to further the business of your employer, uh, you sustain injury which prevents you from continuing to work and support your family, you're entitled to workers' compensation benefits. And I know we can discuss a little bit more about the fact of workers' compensation being a no-fault system and, and how that actually operates differently than if somebody were to get injured on someone's property or to get injured in a car accident or something along those lines. But essentially, an undocumented worker who's going to work and sustains an injury they need to report it just as much as anybody else. What Michael said is absolutely right. The number one uh, most important thing that an injured worker needs to do, documented or not, is to report the injury to their employer, and then it is a very prudent step to get medical attention to make sure that you're giving an accurate account to the medical provider, whether it's an emergency room or a physician, as to exactly how that injury happened. And far too often in my practice, I represent injured workers, including both documented and undocumented. And what we see oftentimes is a pressure that sometimes is brought to bear, sometimes by the employee themselves, mm -hmm. who feel as if they're going to be judged because they got hurt at work, feel that they're going to be um, labeled or have aspersions cast upon them simply because they sustained a work injury. And they will oftentimes either not report the injury, which can be devastating to them and their families down the line because you can't turn the clock back. And the other part of that is that they're going to a doctor's office or to an emergency room and sometimes don't want to say that the injury happened at work. And again, that works to their detriment of both themselves and their family down the line. So it's a, it's a very easy concept, which is that the law will take care of you as long as you tell the truth. 
That's the way Rhode Island's Workers' Compensation Act is set up. And Judge Ferrari, Ferrari can speak more to the issue of how the court views those types of issues when they come up at court, which is an employee who didn't properly report an injury or who goes to a doctor and says perhaps that their injury happened at home uh, because they think they're not going to have to file a workers' compensation claim. And certainly nobody uh, really wants to have to file a workers' compensation claim, but it's there to protect the injured worker. And Michael mentioned in terms of universal coverage how it can be uh, mandatory in Rhode Island and that every employer has to carry it. But it's not like car insurance where you can purchase an uninsured motorist policy yourself mm -hmm. to protect against that employer who doesn't have the coverage. So it really is a situation where you have to rely on that employer to do what they need to do. And if you have any questions, you can access, anybody can access, uh, the public documents, both online or by calling the Department of Labor, to find out if a particular employer is covered with the insurance that they're mandated to have under law. Right. I, I think it's important to know that, uh, especially with uh, new corporations or new businesses, if you will, uh, you know, they start off usually with one person. Uh, small business and uh, you know as time goes on uh, they hire a part-timer and they're like well it's only a part-timer so I don't need coverage well that's not true you do need coverage uh, and by not getting coverage you're actually violating the statute and I think what people need to know is not only is not having coverage in itself dangerous because if that part-time employee gets hurt you're responsible for the medical bills for the compensation uh, the indemnity payments etc but the Department of Labor is going to come along and file a petition saying that you violated the statute and I think the penalty is up to five hundred dollars per day for companies that don't have insurance and that's a pretty severe penalty so uh, sometimes it's 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 something that happens where you know you don't pay attention to it you hire a part-time and think well it's not necessary but I think everyone should know once you hire one employee whether it's part-time whether you're putting a your family member on the books etc then you have to have coverage because if not you're subjecting yourself to having a claim without insurance to protect you and secondly you're also subjecting yourself for penalties from the Department of Labor and Training under the statute um, also to talk about an undocumented worker the court's concern is whether or not there was an injury at work that arose out of and in course of the employment the court is not concerned whether or not the employee who was injured is a documented worker or an undocumented worker. Uh, there was a case that was heard by uh, the trial court, appealed to the appellate division, and the Supreme Court eventually gave a decision that essentially said that. The trial judge said on credibility grounds that because he discovered or determined that the worker was illegal and that was using a different social security number, uh, that that based on credibility grounds, he was going to deny the petition. And it was a, uh, an injury that was uh, well-evidenced, well-witnessed. Uh, the gentleman that got hurt hurt his hand, I believe, went immediately to the hospital. Two co-employees witnessed it. The foreman uh, was there and sent him to the hospital, et cetera. Uh, the appellate division said, well, we, don't, uh, we can't overturn this decision because we don't feel there was an error uh, and that the trial judge was clearly wrong. And the Supreme Court said, hey, wait a minute. You know what, this gentleman certainly was injured. It was unrebutted evidence that he sustained an injury at work. Uh, his employer, the supervisor, two foremen knew about it. He went right to the emergency room. It was documented in the emergency room report. We're not concerned whether or not this person is legal or illegal, documented or undocumented. This gentleman hurt himself at work, and that's what the statute says. He's entitled to compensation benefits, and therefore, uh, we're going to fine for the employee. And that's the state of law in Rhode Island. Uh, and when cases come before the court, we're concerned, you know, we don't, we're not concerned whether or not he's documented or undocumented. We're concerned whether or not he got hurt at work and as a result of his work. I think it's important, too, to, to mention that the view of the court is critical in your understanding of that because it's, it's consistent in all cases. Uh, one of the things that has been brought to our attention is oftentimes you'll get a, an immigrant worker who will apply for a job and fill in a series of forms and somewhere slipped in those forms is, a, is a, uh, an opt-out form for an independent contractor. And in many cases, some of the uh, immigrant workers may not, may not be able to read and it's just one of the forms that they're signing their name to. And, and the employer may actually believe that that opt-out form covers them. I can, uh, <coughs> I feel I can address that because uh, 
well aware of that statute requiring an independent contractor to register through the filing of a form with the Department of Labor and Training. And these are not easy issues all the time. The basic analysis is, are you an employee and are you working for an employer? And the employer needs to have workers' compensation insurance. And sometimes, to avoid having that workers' compensation insurance, an employer will have its employees sign those forms. And under most circumstances, those forms are indicative of the fact that there's an independent contractor relationship. But in those circumstances, Bob, that you talk about, where there is someone seeking to skirt the system, the statute or the law absolutely says that the court, Judge Ferreri and his peers, can ultimately make a determination as to whether or not someone is an employee. So just because the person signed that form, it is not legally binding when challenged at the workers' compensation court. And the court will take all of those factors into consideration. So again, are you an employee? You're injured regardless of undocumented worker status. You're entitled to benefits. But if you're an employer, you have to have workers' comp insurance. And you don't have to worry about skirting the system by using those forms under the wrong circumstances. Any questions whether you're an employer? There's many fine independent insurance agents in our state. You can ask them as an employer when you're establishing your business, as Judge Ferreri indicated, do I need workers' compensation insurance? Should I have workers' compensation insurance? Ask those questions. Again, communication's the key. Let's talk about the workers' compensation and what it provides, because some people aren't quite sure right. what happens when I get hurt on the job. And, and it's a situation where it, it has been documented. There is workers' compensation. What can an employee expect, Steve? Let me, let me kind of explain where we are. Um, many years ago, during the Industrial Revolution, we had no Workers' Compensation Act. And essentially, if a worker got injured, he would have the same so-called tort rights as anybody else. He would have to prove that his employer was some way negligent in causing him to be injured. And he would have the right to bring a lawsuit against that employer if the employer's negligence caused him to be injured or her. The problem occurred because as those court cases wended their way through the system, the family oftentimes ended up on the welfare rolls or even worse. Because it takes a long time to litigate an injury claim, a negligence claim. And that was doing nothing to help that worker get back to work. It was doing very little to help them get the medical care they needed to recover from their injury. Likewise you'd have a situation where an employer would be faced with possible lawsuits from workers that they've hired. And there would be questions of creating an adversarial relationship between the two as to whether or not a negligent condition existed on the work site. So the so-called great compromise came in after the Industrial Revolution passed and we started to become a more enlightened uh, uh, country as regards workers' rights. And the Great Compromise essentially says that each side was going to get something and each side was going to give something up. And as an injured worker, you obtained the right to be entitled to receive workers' compensation benefits without having to prove that your employer did anything negligent to cause your injury. You simply had to prove that you're in the course of your employment at a place you're expected to be, doing what you're expected to be doing, at a time you're expected to be doing it. And you're not under the influence of any drugs or alcohol, and you get injured, regardless of whether the fault for the injury was your own. You're entitled to workers' compensation benefits. Now the employer would say, why should I end up having to pay for a worker who perhaps was being careless on the job and injured himself when he could have been a little bit more careful? Well, the rub, so to speak, or the great compromise was that that employee, although entitled to benefits now, isn't entitled to the same amount of benefit compensation or damages that one would have gotten in the old days in a straight negligence claim. You're no longer entitled to loss of consortium, compensation for pain and suffering, or even your full lost wages. What an injured worker gets, even today, 
under the workers' compensation system here in Rhode Island is compensation for your medical care. You're entitled to the best care that the system has to offer at the cost of your employer's insurer. In addition to that, you're entitled to a partial wage replacement for as long a period of time as that injured worker cannot do their regular employment. In addition, if that employee has any permanent disfigurement to their body or a permanent loss of function as determined by a doctor, they're entitled to some compensation for that. Now there are uh, additional benefits such as rights to rehabilitation, uh, rights to use a facility we have in the state of Rhode Island called the Donnelly Center and what they have to offer in terms of psychological support and things of that nature. But also, something that's very important to the people that come into my office for representation, and I explain this to them right off the bat, they have a right to reinstatement. And that is very important because sometimes when labels are placed on people who are out injured, the labels are that these people are freeloaders or that they're not looking to get back into the work workplace. And that's just not the case. And I find that the people who walk, who walk into my office, their biggest concern is how am I going to get back to work and earn a living for my family? Because although you get these benefits from workers' comp, you're not getting your full wages. So your, your bills don't stop. The mortgage doesn't get cut down. The credit card bills don't get cut down. And yet you have to make do with less. So there is an incentive for these people to get back to work. And you have a right to reinstatement for up to one year from your anniversary of your injury in Rhode Island to get back to that job if you get cleared by a doctor to return. And that's, that's an important benefit that I think is sometimes lost uh, on people in the state of Rhode Island. What happens if an employer should determine that he doesn't want that person or she doesn't want that person to go back to the job prior to that and shuffles them off in another corner of the, in, of the, corner of the shop or to do something else? It's, it's not a very good strategic move by the employer. Hmm. I, I can remember years ago, Mike had asked me to come and speak uh, to self-insureds and employers at Beacon. And at the time, I was working with Steve at Calvino Law Associates, and, and my practice generally was representing employees. It wasn't until I took the bench. Uh, and I said the worst thing at that time, and I think Mike remembers it, the worst thing an employer could do is to take an adversarial relationship with the employee once they got hurt and to say, you know what, you're fired, get out, we don't need you anymore. It is absolutely the worst thing they can do for several reasons. Uh, number one, the employee now says, well, I don't have a job to go back to, so uh, I, I certainly am not going to kill myself in trying to get recover from my injury. I'm going to take my time and, and, and you know, do it as gradually instead of making an effort that maybe would be uh, a lot quicker. Uh, secondly, you know, let's face it, it's just human nature. The employee has no job to go back to. So again, they're not going to try to get a job. They're going to try to collect the check most times because they, they figure, hey, I, am not, I have no job to go back to, so I'll collect a check as long as I can. Uh, I think under those circumstances, it's in everyone's best interest for the employer and the employee to kind of get together and say, all right, how can we help you? Employee was injured at work. Uh, we certainly didn't want this to happen. You know, get them the proper medical treatment keep in touch with the employee, and I think in those situations you'll find that the claim uh, proceeds in a much quicker pace, that the employee will get back to work, that the reinstatement, the whole reinstatement statute will come into effect, and maybe even get the employee back in a light duty position before they're able to do their regular job. I think many two times, many often, uh, employers will take a stance, draw a line in the sand and say, you know what, we don't want you back, and it's it's human nature. I'm not blaming the employers. I know you know it's just human nature. You got hurt in my business. We don't want you back. And again, human nature. I'm part of the employees, and I've represented them. Well, if that's the case, then uh, you know what? I'm gonna stay out as long as I can. And, and this creates a problem. Uh, I think it's in everyone's best interest. It doesn't do anyone, anyone, and any good to have an employee stay out as long as they can because, let's face it, it, it's not good for the employee. It's certainly not good for the insurance company or the workers' compensation system. It's in everyone's best interest when someone gets hurt. Let's deal with it. Let's get them the best treatment possible. Let's see if we can get them. If it's a drastic injury, as Steve said, they can get retrained, and the insurance company will pay for that you know, and get them back to work. Um, but oftentimes, that's not the case. It's important also to note from the employer perspective, for those in your audience that are employers, the statute requires, as Steve indicated, for you to take them back to work. And if you don't, 
not only are you in front of our workers' compensation court, within three weeks, standing in front of a judge, within that three weeks, the judge can order you to pay back pay, owed benefits, and if benefits were terminated in any way of whatever nature, you're obligated to pay for the damages arising from that failure to continue to provide those benefits and order you to take the employee back. And while there are exceptions to both uh, the obligation to reinstate the injured worker, some minor ones, and coverage, it is a very powerful statute. And as this program began, communication is the key. Judge Ferreri couldn't have said it better because the sooner an employer gets an employee back to work, it minimizes your exposure under your policy, and in the long term, it minimizes your premium after you've paid benefits for a compensable work-related injury. So it's in everybody's best interest to get this injured worker back to work as quickly as possible. What about in a situation where, <clears throat> we know it happens periodically, there may be a worker who goes home, something happens at home, and he claims it happened on the job. How, do, how does the court, how do the insurance carriers, how do attorneys even begin to address that? Well, uh, in the first instance, we're, we at our office investigate the claims that come in the door. We certainly have a reputation to uphold, and we're officers of the court, and we see ourselves as such. So it's not in anybody's best interest to clog up the system with cases that have no merit. So we don't even bring those cases. We would never contemplate representing those types of people who are going to come in if there's any inkling whatsoever that a person is being less than candid or in some way the injury is not really a work-related injury and they're trying to pass it off as such. Um, I can only say that there are certain penalties that uh, pertain and should to attorneys that try to bring claims like that. Um, I will say, for people that are injured at work, one of the benefits is that they can obtain legal representation at no cost to themselves. That's very important to know because, if, as we've talked about the system, it can be a very tricky system uh, as you wend your way through it. And that becomes a byproduct of our society and, and being as um, advanced as we are in some regards in the fact that you can get an advocate who's trained in the area, who's experienced in the area at no cost to you to help you through the system. But I can certainly tell you that the court, and Judge Furry can speak for the court, uh, but my experience is they have very uh, little patience for people who are trying to bring claims with no merit. So let me ask you about that. Well, workers' comp is a little different than, uh, let's say, superior court with jury trials. And in superior court, obviously, the jury is the trier of fact. With workers' comp, the judges are the triers of fact. And we assess credibility. And, you know, we do it on a daily basis. And all of the judges that are on the workers' compensation court were practicing attorneys before they uh, became judges. And, you know, they know what to look for and certainly how to assess credibility. And it, also it's the insurance company's job to uh, investigate claims and to bring some information before the court so that we can make the correct determination. Uh, the first thing that we look at, or that I look at as a judge, uh, when a, you know credibility is being uh, raised, or you know whether or not it actually happened at work, was first of all, you know, show me the emergency room report. What does it say? All right. Does it say something about an injury at work, or does it not mention work at all? All right. The second thing is, you know, was an incident report filed? Was notice given to the employer? Okay. The third thing is, how long has that employee been working for the employer? I mean, has he only been there for a short time, two weeks, three weeks, or has he been there for 15 years? You know, fourthly, prior claims. Does he have a history of making workers' compensation claims or being or making any type of claim for injury? Uh, has he had prior injuries? And all these things are factored into by me when I'm trying to assess credibility and determine whether or not this injury arose out of it in the course of the employer employment. And, and also, you know, we look at the employees you know, how they appear before the court at pretrial conference and also at, when they testify before the court. We assess the credibility of the witnesses that the insurance carriers or the employers bring in. And, you know, I like to say we get it right most of the time because uh, uh, all of the judges have been around a long time and uh, we've got a knack for 
trying to figure out whether an employee is maybe fudging it a bit or telling the truth. Uh, but also credit to, to both the employee's attorney and the employer's attorney, because at Workers' Comp, we have real seasoned attorneys who all get along, uh, which is a big plus, and who do a great job. I mean, they, you know, Mike and Steve can go at it and try a case before me and go neck and neck, and then the next thing, you know, they're having coffee downstairs discussing it. And that's not to say anything about whether or not, you know, they're making any concessions. It's just that, you know, that's the nature of the beast at Workers' Comp. Everyone gets along, everyone does a good job, and and because everyone does a good job, it makes our job assessing credibility a lot easier. Well, I think even the discussions here in CD makes it pretty clear that the workers' compensation system is really designed for the entire state. It's not leaning toward the employer. It's not leaning toward the employee. It's providing a secure system that ensures that if an employee is hurt in the job, there will be benefits, and if the employer did what he or she was supposed to do, then all of the, all of the, the benchmarks and the securities are in place for that to happen. We are very fortunate in this state and uh, in that we have a workers' compensation system that is as finely tuned almost as it can be. Uh, I would say that uh, our state is unprecedented in the fact that the litigants, the employee and the employer, the only two important players in the system, are standing in front of a judge typically within 19 days, less than 21 days, from the data a uh, petition is filed from originally Chief Judge Aragon and the leadership now of Chief Judge Healy and the rest of the bench. They are extraordinary in determining these issues within 21 days. And then if it becomes necessary for people to testify under oath, then there's a trial and obviously that takes a little bit longer. But to your point of what the employer does to investigate these claims in the circumstance you gave of someone going home without reporting the injury. It's up to all parties to investigate, ask questions, and we return again to the importance of candor and prompt notice. If the insurance company calls the employer when they learn about a claim, either from the employer, from the employee calling the insurance company, from the initial medical provider or some other medical provider submitting invoices and reports to the insurance company who, don't, who does not know about the injury. If they can speak to the employer and the employer says, oh yeah, that injured worker told me about the injury, I recall that. It happened on X machine or on X job. There's never usually a problem because no one wins by ending up in court, but sadly, it creates delays if it's not reported by the employee or the employer to the insurance carrier. It creates expense <clears throat> and it takes time for everyone to go to the Garrity building and uh, stand in front of a judge and, and uh, argue about whether or not the injury occurred. So prompt communication under all circumstances in the best interest of everybody. In those circumstances, the claim should be paid. The injured worker should get treatment. They should be taken back to work, and neither I nor Steve nor Judge Ferrari need to get involved. But uh, sometimes failures on the side of both the employee and the employer necessitate an appearance in court for an ultimate determination of the issue of whether there was a work-related injury. It is important to keep in mind that um, both from the injured worker's perspective as well as the employer's perspective, the filing of a workers' compensation claim is not a lawsuit per se. An injured worker is not suing their employer, nor is their employer being sued by the employee simply because the employee is reporting an injury that occurred at work. If the report is taking place at work in a timely fashion, the system is working as it's designed to work. Everybody at that point is doing what the system would hope they would do. The injured worker reporting the injury and the employer taking that report and in turn passing it on to their insurer. I think in many ways, uh, even when we're carrying on information sessions for high school students, we say in reality it's no different than the process for an accident report for a car accident. The concept is the same. Nobody's suing anybody, you're walking through the process. But the one of the things that we've found over the last number of years are the numbers of high school students who are working part-time jobs or what the, whatever case it may be 
and they don't understand that they're covered by workers' compensation. Each year, the Institute probably um, carries on conversations and gives information sessions to more than 1,500 students. In, in many cases, it's not just the Institute. We've seen situations where Chief Justice he uh, uh, Healy yes. and Michael, you've been there, and, and, and Stephen, you've been there, Judge. From the courts, they've been more than consistent in working with the Institute to make sure that young adults get the information because all too often, we have high school students who are being hurt in the job. They're going home telling their parents, and it then transfers over to the parents' medical insurance, where it really shouldn't be. Well, Chief Judge Healy uh, created a program called Yes, Rhode Island, uh, Young Employees Safety in Rhode Island. And both Mike and, and Steve are members of that group, as well as myself. And what we do is we go to high schools, and typically we target 15 and 16 year olders, uh, you know, children who are just getting into the workforce, and explain to them what their rights are. And you are absolutely correct, Bob. Uh, many of them don't even think they have rights, uh, let alone know what a workers' compensation claim is and how it can be filed. And it's, it's, it's a very powerful presentation. Uh, we have uh, a, a video of a client that actually I represented who uh, tells about his injury. He actually lost an eye at work. And it is just a powerful video. And it's amazing the questions we get and the number of children or students that come to see us after the presentation and say, well, you know, I got hurt. I did This happened to me. What are my rights? But uh, just briefly, uh, young adults, Children, students that are under 18 that get hurt at work are treated the same way as a person over 18. They get the same rights. They get, they're entitled to have any medicals associated with their work injury paid by the insurance carrier. They're entitled to uh, a check if they, uh, lose, if they are unable to work for three or more days. They're entitled to scarring and disfigurement. And, and oftentimes, uh, they have scars. They have burn marks from either dealing with hot objects or working on a grill or uh, frying fries or pouring coffee, et cetera. And they don't realize that they have these rights. And they're left with permanent marks on their arm. And we tell them that, and they're like, oh. Uh, and it's just like a revelation. Oh, we do. Oh, you absolutely do. So it's important to know, yes, that Everyone has these rights. Uh, whether you're 15, 16, 14 years old, you have the same rights as a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old, and you're entitled to uh, workers' compensation in the form of medicals, indemnity payments, or specific compensation, which would be the scarring, loss of use, et cetera. Well, what about a student? Now, we know that the student is working part-time. Is the employer aware? Should the employers be aware of? That's an employee. It needs to be documented in terms of the number of employees that you have. That goes back to what we initially talked about universal coverage. Uh, even part-time employees are employees and are covered under the Workers' Compensation Act and are covered under the insurance policies issued by Beacon or whatever insurance carrier is insuring the employer. And the, again, they are entitled to the same things that a full-time employee is entitled to. And they don't realize that. Not many people do realize that, but that's an important fact. Employer, employees are maybe minors are entitled to more. So not only is right, the judge right. correct. With treble damages yeah. in certain, certain, certain situations. In the sense, so employers in the audience need to be aware they can't be putting minors in dangerous situations in the workplace because they're, if there's a violation of federal law in placing minors in a dangerous situation, there's treble damage entitlement to injured uh, minors as well. Yeah. Right, what, what I was going to add is that employers need to be aware of what the labor laws are because there are restrictions on how old an employee can be and operate machinery, for example. There are restrictions on the hours those employees can work during school hours and based upon what their age is. And it's important for the employer as well as the young adults to know this. Now we're going out and we're trying to educate the students on the fact that they have the right to say no when being put in a dangerous situation. They have the right in an unfamiliar situation for them, employment, to understand that there are limitations on the jobs that they can do. After all, as we tell the students, they already have full-time jobs, school. Sure. So for them to leave school and then try to do a 30 or 40 hour job on top of that, that's quite a lot to be placing on a young adult. And they really need to understand that they have rights in the workplace, 
but also the employer needs to understand not to put them in those situations because it can turn out badly. It's interesting when you talk about that because we oftentimes do co-presentations on child labor laws and on workers' compensation in the state. And periodically, somebody from the institute will go out and say, yeah, we're doing a presentation presentation today on child labor laws. And automatically, people say, well, that doesn't exist anymore. They're not chaining students to machines anymore. And they, I think there needs to be a very clear understanding that there are state regulations and laws with regards to the employment and placement of students who are 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 year olds that, like you say, if you put them in a dangerous situation, um, we've done presentations to groups of students who were 14 and 15 years old who said, I pump gas and I work in a, in a car wash. And I, I think what ends up happening is that we almost have to take a look at legislation over the years and see how legislation has changed, ensuring that at one point, if you were 15, you might have been allowed to pump gas, but that's not the case anymore. You may have been allowed to work in a, in a car wash. Judge? I think employers should know that the Department of Labor and Training has a great website uh, for young employees and if you go on their website and you see young employees or workers' compensation claims, it just gives a very basic presentation on what young employees can or cannot do. And Mike's correct, if, if a young employee who's 14 or 15 is working on dangerous machinery, a saw, a chainsaw, a maybe even a meat slicer and gets hurt, then that the employer and the insurance carrier is subject to paying them treble damages, which would be three times what the employee would be entitled to in weekly indemnity and also three times what the employee would be entitled to in disfigurement, scarring, and loss of use. Uh, so that site is actually a tremendous site. We use it a lot with the S Rhode Island and our presentations. And it's easy to access. Uh, you look on the workers' compensation site of the Department of Labor and Training and it has, I believe it's young employees if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and it just has real basic information and it will show the employers what these young employees can and more importantly cannot do. And I can even say that, I mean, the Institute on a regular basis is willing to go anywhere we have to go to give that information. I know how committed the courts are and how committed both Beacon and, and, and many of the attorneys are in saying, listen, we'll go to the community tomorrow and give them all of the information, whether it's adults, but also for, for young adults, because I think that in many ways, there are many of them who because of just pure ignorance of the situation, don't understand that they are indeed covered. I think the important thing too, in doing the Yes Rhode Island presentations and also representing employees, because I've represented several young employees who have gotten treble damages, but have also gotten horrific injuries. Right. Uh, young employees are afraid, uh, just like many employees. They're afraid to say no to an employer who's asking them to do something that they've never been trained for. They're afraid to make a claim because they're afraid they might lose their jobs. And, and I try to tell them and I try to put it in their level. I understand the fear, but you know, first of all, you're working at a part-time job and you're going to school. As Steve said, your main job is school. Right. So even if you get let go, even if an employer says, oh yeah, you're gonna make a claim, I'm terminating you, I'm sure you can get a job somewhere else working part-time. I'm not making light of what you're doing, but it's something that you really got to start learning as a young adult, that you got to start, you know, protecting yourself essentially. And I think it's important to know that that you know they they they're very afraid. They're afraid to make a report. They're afraid to go to the hospital because mm -hmm. they're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of the employer yelling at them. And it's also true when they're giving things to do. Like I represented one employee who was asked to go use a meat slicer to cut meat because they were in a pinch in this particular employment, and he did so. And he should have never done that. He never had any experience or training. And sure enough, he cuts, severs uh, tendons in his hand with a permanent injury. And, and, and I, I bring that to their attention and I bring to their attention the video that we show and I said, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth getting a permanent injury because you're afraid to tell your employer no? And I also tell them and I try to coach them, listen, you know, say, I I've never done that and quite frankly, ask the employer, what happens if I get hurt since I've never done that? And I can tell you that if the employer hears the words, if I get hurt, they're really gonna step back and say, well, you know, maybe we'll get someone else to do that particular task. Uh, but you know, education is, is important for both employers and employees. They really need to know, number one, what the employee is entitled to, and the employers need to know what they can or cannot give an employee to do. I, I would think, be, if I may, I'd be remiss as a, uh, as someone from Beacon Mutual or from the insurance industry, if I didn't say what you get under your worker's comp policy is not only the payment of the benefits to the injured worker and a defense in the event a lawyer is needed, but most importantly what Steve 
and Judge Ferreri and you, Bob, have talked about, you get loss prevention services from your insurance carrier. So when you're an employer and you have any questions, you contact your insurance company and you ask for that education because you're entitled to it under your policy. If you're a Beacon policyholder, a loss prevention representative I know will be made available to you to help provide a safe workplace for all your employees. So again, communication it's, it's resolves the all the problems and it takes care of both the employer and the employee. But never be afraid to ask for those loss prevention services under your workers' comp policy if you're an employer. The old axiom is true, knowledge is power. Yeah. And uh, knowledge is the enlightenment you need. And that's the reason why employees who get injured at work are not automatically creating an adversarial position or situation by simply seeking out the counsel of an attorney experienced in handling workers' compensation claims. As I mentioned, they get the representation at no cost to them. And in addition to that, they should not be relying upon the insurer and putting the insurer in a situation where they're being relied upon to counsel both the employer and the employee, because that's not really their function. And so that's the reason why our system in Rhode Island has the ability for these individuals who get injured to obtain legal counsel to have their questions answered. And if there are people who have language issues in terms of they may not speak English or they may not understand English, they shouldn't be signing documents that they don't understand or haven't been explained to them properly. And they should seek out the counsel of lawyers, counselors who are experienced in workers' comp and also can communicate with them so that the message is clear that they're getting. Because again, if you don't have that knowledge, sometimes that's what creates the adversarial situation. So why feel your way through a dark room with the lights turned off when you can get the illumination on what your rights are and know it up front? Just to follow up on that and what Mike said, I, you know, there's fear on the part of the employee, but there's also fear on the part of the employer. Mm -hmm. You know, do I report this claim? Can I try to mitigate this claim without reporting it so maybe my insurance premiums won't go up? And it's the wrong thing to do. I mean, like Mike said, call the insurance company and say, listen, this person got hurt. What do I do? And they'll tell you, you know, they'll work with you because the best thing to do is to report it, get someone that deals with claims all the time to help you, point you in the right direction, work with the employee and work together and you'll find you'll be mitigating your claim far superior than if you tried to do it on your own for sure. I, I, I think all of the information that you've shared tonight and the information that we've had at the Institute over the last number of years has made it very clear that, as you say, Mike, that the communication is the most important factor here. And whether you're the person who's injured or the employer who is responsible for that particular person, it's the communication among the employer, the employee, the insurance system, the carrier, that, that really will resolve the issue, not just more effectively, but far more efficiently. I got to say that the Institute um, has really been instrumental and a partner to the system in terms of getting the word out. Uh, I know in going into the community and speaking to various groups, uh, immigrant community, uh, community forums that we go to on weekends, the Institute has been instrumental in getting the message out as to what people's rights are and the fact that you, these rights aren't something that are written on a piece of paper somewhere. They're real, and they belong to these people. And in many instances, the promise of America is to come here and realize the American dream and have a job and provide for your family. And you'd like to be able to do that without sustaining injury. But it's nice for these people to know that if they are injured, they still have rights. And I, I just want to compliment the Institute in doing that. And the court's been instrumental, Judge Healy and all of his judges, in trying to get that message out as well. And I, I, and I got to say, Mike's insurer, Beacon, has also been an instrumental partner in getting the message out. And in that regard, we're all unified mm -hmm. because we want people to know what their rights are. Well, it's interesting because I know in talking with uh, Chief Judge Healy, he will often say the system works when the number of claims are up because in reality what's happening, the system is functioning, particularly when we're talking about youth. Because 
now all of a sudden everybody's becoming more informed and you can see that cases that ordinarily weren't addressed didn't get there, they were not documented. There are situations where you can see in some cases the, the issue of communication and working together creates a system that does work and you know the cases may be up but they're up and they're done in the right way and I think that that's absolutely critical. Michael, do you have anything to add from the insurer, from the general discussion that we've had tonight? The only thing I would, uh, I would uh, conclude with is what has been highlighted throughout the show, which is communication. The employer and the employee lose if they don't communicate. And even if there's some question regarding uh, the extent or the credibility of the communication, we're fortunate in our state to have a court that's accessible and efficient and prompt in making determinations on those issues. So um, if you're an employer, talk to your insurance carrier and your independent insurance agent if, and uh, just make the right determination. And if there's any question as to whether or not you need workers' compensation insurance, notwithstanding the fact that I work for an insurance carrier, get the policy because uh, in the event you're uninsured, as Judge Ferreri indicated, not only are you being chased by the injured worker, you're being chased by the Department of Labor and Training with civil and criminal penalties as well. Excellent. Judge Furry, any closing comments? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting us to, to be here. And I, and I think I, I'm going to echo the sentiments of both Mike and Steve. I think communication is very important. Uh, I understand that fair factors into every worker's compensation injury, both on the part of the employee and the employer. But I think. Uh, everyone should know that if they all work together, if the employer you know, notifies the insurance carrier and they get on the claim right away, if the employee uh, files the incident report and gets the appropriate treatment, then I think everyone will be happier. And as you said, claims may be up, but this will be a shorter duration for this particular exactly. claim. And more importantly, the employee is going to get better and get back to work, back to his regular job. And I think it's a win-win for everyone. And I think that's what everyone needs to understand. Stephen, we've been working together for a long time, and right. the institute has is appreciates all of the work that anyone, everyone does, from the courts through the insurer and all of the attorneys that we work with. Any observations in closing this evening? Well, I also want to say thank you, um, and I really want to thank Mike for uh, being a partner in this. It is not an adversarial relationship between the plaintiff's bar and the defense bar in our state. Uh, Beacon is very efficient, I must say, in terms of the way they handle the claims. The courts can't be quicker. Um, they're extremely quick and fast and efficient in handling the cases in Rhode Island. You can't really ask for a better workers' compensation system than the one we have here in the state of Rhode Island. So I encourage people to work safely, but when injured, follow the good advice of reporting the injury, communicating, as Mike said, and following up with a doctor and getting counsel at no cost to you. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank all three of you for being here. Thank you. Um, thank you. Michael from Beacon, Judge Ferrari from the Thanks, law Bob. courts, from the co workers' compensation courts, and Stephen, not just from yourself and Calvino Law, but for all of the attorneys that work so hard. I thank all of you for being here. Um, I look forward to another meeting again when we can carry on more conversations that will inform more Rhode Islanders about the rights that they do have under the workers' compensation law in the state. Thank you for joining for uh, joining us, and I hope that everyone enjoyed this evening's conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Michael. Good job, Alan. All right. Thanks, Judge. Thanks, Judge. Steve. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are we all done? Just chat for a little bit. Okay. okay. The um, it, it's interesting. I think. Thank you for joining us for this evening's edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week here on Channel 14. Join us on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m.
For nearly 30 years, the Institute for Labor Studies and Research has been growing unions and building futures. Since it first opened its doors on 15 Jefferson Street near the State House, the Institute has offered education and training programs to more than 125,000 working Rhode Islanders. In a rapidly changing economy, employers need a workforce that's able to adapt to change. The Institute is committed to offering programs that provide our students with the skills to meet the demands of this new economy. Our programs range from worksite English as a second language and GED classes, worksite Spanish targeted to more than 22 specific industries and professions, customized computer training ranging from beginner to advanced, national certification preparation classes in water distribution, and a host of other offerings designed to make program participants more effective at their jobs. We were one of the first in Rhode Island, probably over 22 years or thereabouts. We had a number of nursing homes that, um, that it really made a difference in the lives of the workers in places where Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking workers were able to pick up English as a second language. Becoming proficient in English is going to help them progress in the union, in life in general. It was the institute that we turned to, to teach our teachers how to speak conversational Spanish so that um, our teachers could communicate with the parents of our children. Three decades has been working uh, hand over fist to try and bring education and knowledge uh, to ordinary uh, working people, regardless of where they work. To be able to do it at work takes a great burden off people, and the Institute provided the classes provided uh, wonderful teachers that understood where people were coming from. Absolutely incredible the way she worked with the students. And she geared the whole curriculum around health and safety. Not only general health and safety, but she also took part of my curriculum that they need to have. We have to have 144 hours a year. And she utilized that and made it part of her curriculum. Most recently, we have announced our partnership with the National Labor College in Silver Spring, Maryland, and the establishment here at the Institute of the Edward J. McElroy Satellite of the National Labor College to service members of organized labor throughout New England. We can accredit apprenticeship training and couple those experiences and courses done in labor education. Be able to actually have our kids go through school and actually qualify with our credits we get for the apprentice program. So an individual is now here in Rhode Island can get a bachelor's degree in labor studies right here in Rhode Island at the Institute. I see people going on from simply taking a course here to going to the community college to get maybe a four year bachelor's degree while they're still working. And every once in a while, somebody comes down to URI and gets a master's degree in labor and industrial relations. That's what the labor movement's about, moving people up build these people into better citizens. That's major in growing the union. Which everyone knows nowadays is more important than ever. So, I mean, they've been a valuable resource. It's a key instrument in strengthening the labor movement and revitalizing the labor movement. So it's our responsibility not only to raise the resources, but to explain to people how this really sews together the fabric of a decent life for our members, for our people who are not our members, for people generally in the state of Rhode Island. When you support the Institute for Labor Studies, you support the labor movement in Rhode Island.